This is Chichao 2, a spacecraft that China just launched to the moon in March 2024. It's a lunar relay satellite, but more importantly, it's a crucial piece for China's ambitions to establish a long-term presence on the moon in the coming decade. Let's explain. There's a very important fact to understand about the moon. Its period of revolution around the Earth corresponds exactly to that of the moon's rotation around its own axis. This is called tidal locking and results in the moon always having the same side facing the Earth. And this is why historically almost all lunar landing missions have taken place on this visible side of the moon, because it's simply the only face we are able to communicate with, with our ground stations. But this is changing. The world's great space powers are now interested in more than just the Earth facing side of the moon. In the coming years, China, as well as the US and its partners and others, are interested in the far side of the moon, which has been relatively unexplored up to now, and even more so the lunar south pole, which is understood to have water under the form of ice and its permanently shadowed craters. For this, relay satellites are necessary, and they are satellites that are in the vicinity of the moon that are visible to both spacecraft on the lunar surface and to Earth-based ground stations, relaying data and enabling smooth communications. China first demonstrated this capability in 2018. The Chinese sent the Chuechao spacecraft in a halo orbit around the Earth-Moon L2 Lagrange point to support the Chang'e 4 mission, which landed a rover on the far side of the moon. At the time, this caught the world's attention, since while the concept of a relay satellite is not exactly new, this was the first time that it was implemented around the moon. Six years later, on March the 20th, 2024, China reiterated this feat, sending a larger and improved relay satellite, the Chuechao 2 that we were talking about, into an elliptical frozen orbit. This 1.2-ton spacecraft's main objective will be to support the Chang'e 6 sample return mission, a mission that is scheduled to launch in May this year to collect samples in the South Pole Aitken Basin on the lunar far side. Beyond Chang'e 6, Chuechao 2 will also support the Chang'e 7 and Chang'e 8 missions in 2026 and 2028, with both taking place at the lunar south pole. The parameters of the Chuechao 2 orbit were selected very carefully to suit these missions. Chuechao 2 has a 24-hour orbit and is highly elliptical. The furthest point away from the moon, aka the apogee, is at a distance of 16,000 kilometers, while the closest point, the perigee, is at 200 kilometers. And due to the way orbital mechanics works, this means that the satellite will spend most of its time on the apogee side where the angular speed is lowest. And since the apogee was conveniently set to be facing the lunar south, this means that Chuechao 2 will be visible to the Chang'e 6 mission for over 20 hours per 24 hour period and will be able to relay signals to the Earth. Now, what is seldom mentioned is that the Chuechao 2 mission serves China's broader ambitions to establish a permanent outpost on the moon in the 2030s. This ambition is called the ILRS, aka the International Lunar Research Station, which is today still in the planning phase. For this China-led moon base to realize its full potential, it will require advanced communications, but also navigation and remote sensing services. Last year, China unveiled its long-term lunar communications infrastructure plan called the Chuechao Constellation and is supposed to be deployed in three phases. You have a preliminary phase called the Chuechao 1.0, which consists of the very first Chuechao from 2018, which is still operational. You also have the recently launched Chuechao 2 that we were just talking about. And there is also the Chuechao 3 scheduled at the end of the decade. These are individual lunar relay satellite missions, but they are also stepping stones for something bigger. If we have a closer look at the Chuechao 2 mission, for example, within the payload fairing next to the Chuechao 2 were two smaller lunar satellites called Tiandu 1 and Tiandu 2. These are small demonstrators with a mass respectively of 61 and 15 kilograms and they were also inserted into a lunar elliptical frozen orbit with the objective of testing radio and laser ranging technologies to prepare for lunar navigation services or a lunar GPS, if you will. Now, back to the Chuechao Constellation project. There's a step two to be deployed in the 2030s and called Chuechao 2.0. This is an actual constellation of satellites around the moon consisting of 16 spacecraft. 
There'd be seven satellites situated around the L1, L2, and L3 Earth Moon Lagrange points, two satellites in an elliptical frozen orbit, and six in low lunar orbit, and one in geostationary orbit. This constellation would provide communications with the Earth with a targeted speed of 1 to 10 gigabits per second, but also a positioning accuracy on the lunar surface of 50 meters and some unspecified remote sensing capabilities. And finally, there's the ultimate step, which is Trechow 3.0. This is a futuristic view which sees the interaction of Martian, lunar, and Earth-based interplanetary relay networks. This is probably something for the 2040s or the 2050s and is still a bit hazy, but I think it gives a good idea of where the Chinese want to go. To wrap all this up, I also want to mention that these technologies are not only being explored by China. On the other side of the Pacific, NASA published the LunaNet concept in 2019, which envisions a network of interoperable lunar and terrestrial networks from the US, but also partner nations following common standards. To implement this, NASA created the Lunar Communications Relay and Navigation Systems project in 2022, and similarly, ESA initiated the Moonlight project. With the surge in lunar missions in the upcoming decade, this kind of communications infrastructure is going to be a crucial enabler. So expect to hear more about this in the future. And if you're interested in updates on what Chinese counterparts are doing in this domain, make sure you subscribe to Dongfang Hour. As always, a special thanks to all of my patrons on patreon.com and YouTube memberships who keep this channel going. If you're interested in supporting my work, feel free to join as a member. And with that being said, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.